I enlisted with the idea that I would go to officer candidate school. I had a contract with the Army. So I went through basic and advanced training, went to OCS in Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, and then after graduating from OCS and going, being a tactical officer for six months there, I got orders to go to jungle school and uh, the jungle warf warfare schools in Panama. And I went from there to Vietnam. Got to Vietnam on New Year's Day, 1970. And we immediately began combat operations. Uh, during the day, we'd patrol, try to pick up information, uh, look for signs of activity on the behalf of the guerrillas there, and also for the North Vietnamese, the regulars. And then we got orders to go to Cambodia. On the 23rd of June, 1970, we were on patrol, the whole company. Uh, Toby Chafin, uh, Charlie 26, was leading. My guys were in the back. We were doing rear security. I heard shooting, uh, just all of a sudden rifle fire, and we walked in on a camp. So we shot the place up quite a bit um, until about four o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. We're in heavy jungle, and what happens in the jungle is you've got light, and then all of a sudden it's dark. And so we broke contact and we moved to some high ground and set up a night defense, defensive position. So the morning of the 24th, um, Captain Terry Stull called us together, got his officers together and said, here's our situation. We've been ordered to get to this location. The quickest way there is down the hill, across the stream and back up the other side. And I came up with the order. I put uh, Albero Garcia on point and uh, lined everybody up. I was the fifth in the line of march and we started down the hill. They, uh, they ambushed us with a Chicom Claymore grenade, if you, I'm um, a Claymore mine. And uh, when the explosion went off, it knocked uh, 11 of us down. And uh, so there was no targets to shoot at. There wasn't anything for them to shoot at because we were all down, to all of us that were exposed. Toby, uh, two six, uh, some of his guys came down and got me and the rest of the guys, dragged us back up the hill. Uh, Captain Stoll got a helicopter to come in. I don't know how. Uh, it was there was no place to land. It was pretty tough terrain, and it was really thick jungle. And the helicopter basically lowered a, a penetrator, a fairly heavy hook, down through the trees to the ground, and then we attached Al Garcia to it, and they hoisted it back up into the chopper, about 200 feet. So uh, as I'm looking at him, I kind of sense something in my shoulder. And at the same time, I see something hit him in the arm. And what had happened was the North Vietnamese, while they had been quiet while we were doing what we were doing, decided shooting a chopper down was a pretty big, uh, good idea. Um, and so they were shooting at it blindly, really. And uh, the bullet that hit me probably hit branches and leaves and twigs and everything else before it got to me. So that slowed it down. And then after it came out of my neck and and, and hit the chief, uh, uh, it, it didn't penetrate very far on him at all because by then most of the energy was expended. He got me in the chopper and um, an hour later I was at Long Bin, uh, which was a, a evacuation hospital. They triaged us, took Al first. He died, uh, he died that day, uh, 24th of June, uh, a few hours after we finally made it to the hospital. And uh, I woke up a couple of days later. I hadn't lost consciousness through this whole thing until they actually gave me the anesthesia, and, and that was the first time I went out. Uh, and so that's what happened, and I stayed there until the 5th of July and was evacuated to Japan. And a couple of days after I got there, I was sick. I had a fever, and <clears throat> I noticed that um, my belly was swollen. Next thing you know, I'm in intensive care and we're gonna to go to surgery. And uh, when I come out of surgery, um, the first thing I realize is <clears throat> I'm still open. They, they packed the cavity with gauze soaked in iodine and they've got to go back in there. And so there wasn't any reason to stitch everything up because they were just gonna go back in there again as soon as I stabilized. So I'm talking to the doctor, uh, Wayne Wilson, and uh, the doc's explaining to me that unfortunately, when they put me back together in, in Vietnam, there were five holes in my colon that didn't get discovered. 
And when I started eating food, it was like having five ruptured appendixes. And this had all leaked into my cavity, and so I had a significant abdominal infection. So we went back to surgery, and then he worked, and then when I became unstable, I went back to intensive care, same routine. But two o'clock in the morning, uh, I wake up because uh, the medicine's worn off. And I'm laying there contemplating things. And a chaplain comes in and sits down next to my bedside. And he said, well, um, the reason I'm here is Dr. Wilson says uh, you're not going to surgery anymore. And I thought, well, wow, that's a good thing. They put me back together. He says, um, any more surgery, in Wilson's opinion, will kill you. And he asked me to come to talk to you because without the surgery, you're going to die. So I came to pray with you. I told the chaplain that I was probably going to have to give the doc a piece of my mind. Or words to that effect. And that got the chaplain and I to the point where we decided we'd pray for the doctor. When we got done praying for the doctor, he said, the chaplain said, just in case this doesn't work, I see your wife lives in Hawaii. I can have her, her here on a military aircraft uh, day after tomorrow. And uh, I said, do that. So, she comes walking in, comes around the curtain into the in, intensive care where I am, and I'm getting blood. So my arm's out straight. There's a board taped underneath it to keep it straight so that there won't be any clotting, and there's a bag hanging, a bag hanging with blood in it, and it's going in my vein. She comes walking around the corner, and I'm no longer the 220-pound person that she knew. Um, now I weigh 104 pounds, and I'm gray. And she fainted right away and fell over my arm. And before you know it, Wayne Wilson comes running in, jumps up on my bed, and he's straddling me, and he's yelling in my face. And the, the gist of it was, if you had enough strength to hold her up and keep her from getting hurt, you've got enough strength for more surgery. And we went back to surgery. The fact is, she saved my life, pure and simple. Uh, if, if that hadn't happened, Wilson was not going to operate, and I would have continued to waste away until I would have ended up being another one of the 58,000 that ended up with her name on the wall in Washington. So I spent 19 months in the hospital. She spent 18 months in the hospital because she joined me about a month after this all started. And no matter where we were, she, her days included coming to the hospital, checking up on me, seeing what we're doing. Oh, PT's gonna start? Oh, that's great. That constant reminder that there was normalcy out there somewhere and it was worth striving for um, it was huge. Um, it still is. I had to learn to walk a couple of times um, and that last time stuck, fortunately. So I, I was recovering and I was going through the, you know, what now, Can will I be able to work? Will I be able to do something meaningful? And I started that whole process of what's next as reverently as possible, sometimes probably not reverently enough. Um, I'm, I'm wrestling with people who hear part of that, any part of that story that, that, that I recount say, well, God's got a plan for you. Well, I believe that's true. I think God has plans for all of us. But I wasn't happy that he hadn't told me what they were. And I was, um, every now and then I would say, so, what, is this it? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Am, am I following along? Every once in a while, as I was going through this process to get to that ultimate job, have an opportunity to do something for somebody. And every time I did, it felt good. What I do for somebody today 
makes me feel just as good as when I did something for somebody in 1982. Serving others is my daily way of dealing with post-traumatic stress. It's, it's really that simple.